Test. Check, check. Oh, it is on. All right, Harlem, how y'all doing today? All right, let's stand up, let's sing to the Lord, amen? Come on, y'all, let's sing together, let's sing together to the Lord, come on. Amen. 
All right, welcome to Harlem Region. We are here to worship the Lord. He has done so much for us. All right, he has gotten us through an amazing week. Whether we feel like it was an amazing week or not, it was an amazing week. All right, because we are here today to worship him once again. All right, and so as we worship him today, let's give our hearts. Let's give our minds. Let's give our voices. Let's give everything we have, our strength. Let's rely on him to worship him, all right, whether we are singing to him, whether we are listening to his word and letting it change our hearts. Let us worship him. Amen. All right, let us pray. Father up in heaven, thank you so much for waking us up this morning, allowing us to be here to worship you, the one who has given us breath, the given us life, and given us an opportunity to have a relationship with you. Father, I pray that you just give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the know-how, give us the security to worship you in every way, shape, and form. That you allow us to be able to sing to you with glad and sincere hearts. That we are, that we are able to receive your word with joy and allow it to change us and to bring us closer to you, Lord. Father, I pray that you be with everybody that gets on the stage, that they're filled with just as much, if not more. And Father, I pray that you are pleased by what we bring to you, that we bring you our first fruits and that you smile back at us for it. We love you and we pray for all this in your son's name. Amen. Poder 
Olvídate de mí Ven, ven, ven Espíritu divino Ven, ven, ven Apodérate de mí Apodérate oh. Apodérate Apodérate De todo mi ser Apodérate Apodérate Quieres estar conmigo? Vamos a cantar. I get to share. I've got his 
everybody. Um, my name is Kakri Kandua. I'm just going to put out there, I'm a little, I'm pretty nervous right now, so if you notice me shaking, don't be concerned, it's nerves. <laughs> so um, I've been a disciple for seven years now, um, and this is the part of the service where we will reflect on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I'm here to share with you all what the cross means to me. Um, so if you all can turn to Isaiah 53, verse 5. Um, it reads, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment oops, <laughs> that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Another version says, by his stripes, we are healed. So um, growing up, I went through a lot. Um, the divorce of my parents at a young age, interpersonal trauma, bullying at school and home. And on this trajectory, I have suffered with major depressive disorder where I've had feelings of hopelessness and have made multiple attempts to end my life. I suffered with social anxiety where I was terrified of being in social settings, and where I even used to run out of church every Sunday, crying because I was terrified of fellowship. Um, there's also generalized anxiety disorder, where I struggle with multiple worries and anxiety attacks. Um, I've struggled with substance abuse and addiction, impure relationships, and I've even had the toughest time when I went to university and struggled with ADHD and focus in school, which caused me to fail classes and be in danger of not graduating. Throughout this time, um, there have been many times where God pursued me to help lead me to my healing. Within this time, I have also been diagnosed with OCD, where I struggle greatly with distress and intrusive thoughts, followed by compulsions. In September 2020, I was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, followed by lupus in 2021, both of which have been said to be chronic and have no cure. I've been, it's been such a painful struggle, but God has been helping me in my healing. Oh. <laughs> um, through prayer, scripture, supportive friends and providers, God continues to walk through all the pain and physical, mental, or emotional with me. Although most of my struggle is invisible and can be lonely because of, the, um, because of the cross, I have God to run to. He has always seen me and understands my pain. I'm happy to say that since I've begun my healing journey, 
the major depressive disorder has been in full remission. I, <laughs> I have made strides in treatment for OCD where I have even got awarded an OCD conqueror milestone badge. Um, I am now able to fellowship and initiate relationships in the church instead of running away. And I will be clean and sober for eight years this August. <laughs> and that's all thanks to God working through our chemical recovery ministry. <laughs> um, I still go through bouts of pain, anxiety, and challenging intrusive thoughts. But God has been using me in the mental health field to help others in their healing. I am happy to share um, that me even standing here before you all today and sharing my diagnoses of cancer and lupus is a milestone in itself um, for my healing. Um, as it's been a psychological battle um, to the point where for the past four years, I, I've rarely talked about it with anyone, not even my therapist or God. Um, Jesus worked on the cross. Jesus' work on the cross is not in vain. And the wounds inflicted on him for me, the stripes on his body were not in vain. Whether my healing is mostly now, or if it's in God's will for me to wait till heaven, where there are no more tears and sorrow, I'm grateful that he is leading my healing journey. I'm so grateful that I get to share my testimony and experience the power of the cross. I hope for more growth and healing. And I know that he has and will do the same for you all. By his wounds, we are healed. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> thank you. Um, dear God, thank you so much uh, just for the, the work that you've allowed Jesus to do on the cross for us, God. Um, we ask that you forgive us for all the sins that we've done. And we forgive those in our hearts who may have, who may have sinned against us, God. Um, we pray for the body, for the bread, which represents your body, God. Um, and we pray for the blood, God, um, for the drink, which represents your blood, God, which gives us grace. Um, we thank God so much for everything, God. I pray for the rest of the service, and I pray that you guide us um, through our own personal reflection right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
song from the car. Amen? I just want to give it to them again. I don't know. It's been a powerful service by far. I'm just a powerful communion from my sister. I 
loved it. Um, and I'm here to present contribution, amen. Uh, my name is Leo Joaquin. I've been a disciple for 30 years. And uh, that's been a long journey. You know, church, uh, I just want to share from, from my heart. I, I have not been one of the most cheerful givers in, in church. I mean, I stand it. I'm just going to be honest with that. Um, throughout the years, I have struggled with being stingy. And, but, but the Lord rewards repentance. You know what I'm saying? A repented heart, he rewards. Um, we, all of a sudden, I, I felt compelled to give out to the poor, the needy, homeless people that were in McDonald's. Uh, I remember just getting, you, you want to eat something? You want a chicken sandwich? You want some coffee? And I just started giving. I started giving out money, the money that I have, extra change in my pocket, a couple of dollars that I had in my pocket. It was not in my character to do that. But as soon as I started doing that, that my heart changed that way, God blessed me. All of a sudden, I'm doing a job. Me and my boss were doing a job. And all of a sudden, the big boss, we, that, this is beside our weekly paycheck. He rewards, rewards both me and my boss with bonuses. <laughs> and when I opened my bonus, I was like, what? Whoa, I mean, it's not about decimals, it's not about um, the money that was, but just how the Lord showed me what he can do when I repent. When I think about those people that are out there, they're, they're lost, that they don't have no money, they don't have nothing, and most of them are hungry. Um, if you look at the statistics, there's a high percentage of homelessness in the city. There's a lot of people with mental disease. And there's a lot of people in need. So it was like I felt compelled and I did stuff and the Lord rewarded me. And I, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to break it down very easy. I don't want to make a big thing long. But the Lord blesses us when we give just 10%. And think about that, church. 10%. And he gives us back 200%. Back. He gives us that. Now, I don't know about deals, but I'll take that deal anytime. <laughs> that is the best deal in town. I only give you, Lord, 10%, and you come and you give me 25,000% back. Think about that. I'd rather stick with that deal than any deal in town. I mean, it's just, he's a great God, amen? So um, I'm pretty sure Maury has the website back here. NYCC, let's go to the website and let's give cheerfully because we serve a God that really blesses us with everything that we have. NYCCOC.net slash donate. Let's go to our, the website back there and let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you give us, the clothes in our bag, our jobs, our promotions, our bonuses. Everything comes from you, Lord. We don't deserve nothing. You only ask us for a fraction, a 10% for us to give back, so you can give us the world, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your grace. I pray all these, these things in your son's name. Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, Harlem. <clears throat> so it's been a minute since we've heard from our high school ministry about what they've been learning uh, in these lessons and Sunday services. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Rebecca Peralta, who will be sharing about what she learned last week. Um, hello, everyone. I will be sharing about what stood out for me from last week's message, and for me, that was the point of the love being at the core of all fellowship. One of the scriptures shared was Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, which says, follow God's example, therefore, as dear loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragment offering and sacrifice to God. 
Fellowship is such an important part of the church, and this is why this scripture stands out for me. Um, when love is at the core of all fellowship, and when we love like Jesus loved us, we help strengthen the core of fellowship, and that therefore helps us strengthen the church as we strengthen all the like friendships and relationships that we have in the church because they are so helpful in just building us up and building the church up, especially through good times and hard times, um, which is why this like scripture stood out to me so much in Jerome's message. So thank you. stand on up and sing one more song before we get uh, an amazing message. We'll do a little bit of Waymaker. Light in the darkness, my God. 
to our worship team here real quick. Thank you guys for all you do. Uh, also, thank you, Casey, for what you shared earlier on. That was so powerful. Um, so, so, yeah, that testimony is amazing. Um, thank you, Leo. Um, and thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for what you shared as well. I'm very excited to, to continue to hear from our young people uh, here in Harlem. Um, today, I am grateful for Brother Timbala. Um, Tim is, uh, is watching this service at home right now, uh, recovering, and, and brother, let me, let, me, uh, let me say that you are an incredible example of what it means to give yourself fully to the work of the gospel. Um, Tim uh, got home from the hospital on Tuesday and was sending messages making sure that today's service ran smoothly on a Wednesday. Um, he was already on, uh, on his, his, his serving hat was on already, so... Please, Tim, you're listening. Rest up. Uh, we'll hold it down until you get back. Um, and Omanel, you are a rock. Um, thank you for all you do. 
in your participation and partnership uh, here. Um, well, I'm grateful for the Balas today, so thank you guys. You know, my, my kids had um, very different reactions in anticipation uh, to the eclipse that happened last, last Monday. Um, Lucas, who's actually sick at home right now, uh, treated this the way you would expect a child to treat Christmas. Um, he could not wait. He was asking for like an hour by hour countdown. He was watching videos on YouTube from previous eclipses. He was, so, he was making up stats about how eclipses work uh, and, and facts that he just, I'm, I'm pretty sure he just came up with these on, on, on his own. Um, he was talking about it at home, in the car, at school with his friends. He kept calling it the big event. Uh, he, was, he was not going to let this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity pass. I do feel like they said that about the last one and the one before that as well. I don't know how once-in-a-lifetime works, apparently, but um, he was so excited about this. Levi, on the other hand, was terrified. He was getting literal panic attacks and crying as the days got closer to the eclipse. And as Lucas's uh, excitement increased, Levi's fear increased as well. Lucas heard the news about the eclipse and thought about the, the, the specialness of the event. Levi heard about the eclipse and thought about the warning of damaging his eyes. Because of how much it was talked about and how many times he heard, do not look up at the sun uh, without the FDA approved glasses, he created this reality in his mind that no matter what was going to happen, on Monday, April 8th, he was going to lose his eyesight. That caused him to panic. He woke up on Monday morning crying near hyperventilation about what he thought was going to be his last day to see. Meanwhile, that same morning, Lucas woke up with the same information presented, was bubbling with energy, could not wait to get his hands on the glasses to watch the moon drift into the path of the sun. You know, depending on your understanding and preparation, big events around the corner can create incredibly different reactions for the people waiting for it. You know, tomorrow is the tax deadline, April 15th. Depending on your preparation or understanding, you might feel very differently about what tomorrow is supposed to look like. Mother's Day is four Sundays from today. There are going to be people scrambling four Saturdays from yesterday at a CVS trying to find, there will be no cards left on Saturday. But this preparation and understanding creates a very different response to what's around the corner. Now, people in the gospel had very different reactions to Jesus being around the corner as well. Depending on their understanding and preparation, a fact that I think has transferred to our time today as well. Do you understand? Are you prepared? We're going to read a passage in Matthew that looks at the reaction to the entrance of Jesus Christ that is also a fulfillment of a prophecy that was said about him as, as well. Uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew 21. This will be our main text for the day. So this, uh, uh, in Matthew 21, this is the week that Jesus will be killed, treated like a criminal, crucified, and publicly dismantled in a violently poetic act of somehow putting us back together. Understanding the timeline that we are in in this passage is a crucial detail um, uh, because there had been centuries at this point that passed between the entrance of sin and the fall of man in the garden, and now the solution to the fall of man in the garden of Gethsemane, uh, leading to Golgotha, the location of Jesus' death. Is my mic going on and off for you guys as well, or is it just me? Oh, great, sorry. Um, just making sure. Uh, this is the most important week in human history. Imagine something that took thousands of years to plan, and now you are walking up to the days leading to the execution of that plan and the literal execution of an innocent Rabbi Jesus who also happens to be the Son of God and Savior of this fallen world. That's the setting that we're walking into when we read Matthew 21. On Friday, June, uh, uh, on Friday uh, John 12, 1 tells us that Jesus spent most of his time with his best friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
This is the same Lazarus who Jesus brought back to life a few months, possibly even a few weeks earlier. This is when Mary pours the expensive oil on Jesus' feet and wipes it with her hair. Uh, Judas is in the room when this happens and gets upset at Mary for wasting the money on this act of anointing. And Jesus corrects him and tells Judas in front of everyone there that Mary did what was right. In my opinion, in my opinion, Judas is so bothered by this act of public correction that he leaves the home and joins the conversation about getting Jesus killed immediately. Because after this interaction, the gospel notes that uh, after this gathering of friends and the problem of popularity growing from the people who knew that Lazarus died and now they saw him again, the priests came together to plot uh, Jesus' death. And that plot involved Judas. So that was on the Friday. That, that uh, Mary, you're wasting money, and then Jesus correcting Judas. I think Judas was so bothered by that that he leaves to join the plan to get Jesus killed just because of the, the, the timing of, of what's presented here. That's Friday. Saturday is not noted in any of the gospel accounts. Uh, because it was a Sabbath, most likely Jesus spent that time resting and in fellowship with his friends. Sunday is where Matthew 21 starts. Let's read from verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to your daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So uh, Bethpage is about uh, two miles away from Jesus' final destination in Jerusalem. It's a small village uh, on the way to the bigger city, but because of its elevated location on the Mount of Olives, it provided a, a panoramic view um, of Jerusalem in front of it. It's about 2,700 feet above sea level and 200 feet higher than Mount Zion um, where the temple was. So Jesus, as he's walking here, would be able to see everything with Mount Zion and the temple as a focal point. Now, Im imagine that for a second. Walking towards the pinnacle of your calling. Seeing the plan laid out before you. Knowing the pain you must endure. Being the very power that brought life into the world and looking ahead at the place and people that would take your life away. Jesus makes a request in this situation. He asks for a donkey to ride and a younger donkey to carry their stuff. This is a very specific request, which Matthew then notes immediately after as something that happened to fulfill a prophecy found in Zechariah about the king of Zion coming on a donkey and a colt. Um, a, don a, a colt here is just, a, it's a baby donkey that, that no one has ridden before. So, the grand king of heaven riding on this humble creature. But think about this for a second. It was a prophecy. It was prophesied that this would happen. And we know that above all, we must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's 2 Peter 1. So this, this happening was authored by God, but it was not made automatic by God. What I mean by this is that Jesus knew the content of the scripture. He knew what the prophet said. He knew what was supposed to happen, but he, he didn't just sit back idly and wait for what was prophesied to fall on his lap. God had desired for this thing to happen, which is why it inspired the prophet Zechariah to say it in the first place. God wanted it. Jesus knew it was supposed to happen, but then he acted on it to ensure that God's word was fulfilled in his life. It's subtle, but I think this is a vital detail in understanding the connection between God's will and our participation in ensuring that God's will is being fulfilled today in our lives. We have the Bible. We have access to the knowledge of what God wants. But I have to ask myself this question. Am I actively seeking out the
the fulfillment of what God said must happen. Because God promises to forgive us. That's a promise from God. He also says that I must forgive others in order to access that forgiveness. So there's a promise, but I can't just sit back and assume that that's obligated to be given to me. I have to do something to access that promise. Uh, God, God promises to not forsake us. That's a promise. He also says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and holy angels in Luke 9. So God put something out there. I promise this will happen, but I need to participate in order to benefit from that promise. Jesus knew what the scriptures said, and he made sure that his life followed for the prophecies to be fulfilled. Am I living the same way? Am I actively seeking out the fulfillment of what is said uh, about who I should be? Or am I allowing the world's perversion to somehow be the fulfillment that I'm looking for in my life rather than the perfect plan of our perfect God? Very subtle here, but the fact that Jesus actively seeks out the fulfillment of this prophecy I think it's important for us to take note of as we live our lives day to day. In addition to this, a king is not supposed to arrive on a donkey. A donkey is a sign of humility and peace and the common man's work and long, uh, tedious travel. Where is the war horse, Jesus? Where is the battle-ready stallion strapped with protective armor in preparation to carry the sword-wheeling conqueror who was going to slay the leaders of the Roman government? Where, where is that? Where is, where is the power that's going to force the Jews back in their, in their rightful position as the victorious people of God? What is this donkey? Where is the stretch limousine? Where is the armored fleet? King Saul carried a sword. King David carried a sword. King Jehoshaphat carried a sword. King Hezekiah carried a sword. These kings protected Israel by powerful military force on horses, not on a donkey. The Jews, during the time of Jesus, wanted liberation. They wanted freedom. And they only knew about the freedom that comes through physical fighting. And the leader that was going to bring that freedom could not be feeble. He needed to be fierce. That's all they knew. All they knew is we have to be stronger and kill more of their people than they kill of ours. That's the only way we're going to be, uh, become free here. They had set up in their mind what salvation must have looked like. And look how our Lord Jesus takes what we assume to be the only way to solve the problem of oppression and injustice and flips it on his head. They wanted a king of carnage, and God sent a prince of peace. What does that mean for us today? Outside the theology, outside the Christian history, outside the parameters of the Jews getting this wrong, what does this mean? Are you currently operating under the impression that Jesus is something that he is not? Here's an example. Do you force Jesus into your political agendas? Do you find yourself using Jesus to endorse your political um, affiliation or use his teaching to justify your stance on specific policies? Jesus is not on the ballot. And as much as we must think spiritually, even on matters of politics, Jesus did not come here to give us policies. That's not what he came for. We will always end up distorting the, his message of love, justice, and compassion for all people when we try and make Jesus fit into our political ideologies rather than fitting every opinion we carry about anything in life into the teachings of Christ. He did not come here to become our president. He did not come here for a popular vote. He came here to turn the world right side up through love and selfishness selflessness, and not by an extension of the American dream either. Jesus was not American. Just, I think we can acknowledge that, but just think about that for a second. American ideologies would make no sense to Jesus Christ because he wasn't from here. 
So we can't force our way of thinking about things and say, well, Jesus would have supported this. Jesus would have supported that. Therefore, I, as a Christian, I'm making the, the, the Jesus decision here in my politics. We have to be very careful that we don't put Jesus on a horse when he came very differently. We, we, we cannot be pushing and living um, like, like there's a Jesus that, that exists when he actually does not. The political Jesus does not exist. The, the, the political Jesus in an American political system does not exist. So we, we, as Christians living in America, must be very careful that we don't create an image that does not actually fall in alignment with who Jesus claimed to be. Another example, do you look at Jesus and a relationship with him as a means of getting what you want? Do you look at surrender to God's will as a prerequisite for material blessings and tangible success. That if I just follow Jesus long enough or well enough, tangible things will follow me. I will get all the things that I want. Jesus did not come here to give us a raise or a promotion or recognition at our jobs. He came to give us access to his immaterial kingdom which is, far, which is of far greater worth than anything this world can scrape together. But if we look at him as a means to tangible success, he never claimed to be that thing. Now, I do think that God blesses his people. I do think that I have been given opportunities exclusively because of God's intervention. But I, I could never say that hey, if you just follow the Bible well enough, God will give you your dream house. God will give you your dream job. Your boss will acknowledge that you are the best worker in the company. That, that's just not what's found here. Jesus never made that promise. But if we're treating him as a tool to advance ourselves materially, it's just not a Jesus that exists. So just like the, the, the Jews here were waiting for their Savior to come, with a sword and slay anyone who was in the way. And Jesus said, hey, that's just not me. I think we have to take a look at who we have drawn up to be Jesus as well and make sure that it always follows with the gospel and not our preferences. Because my preferred Jesus sometimes does not act like this. My preferred Jesus is, a lot, is, is, is very different at times than this, but I have to sit that preferred Jesus down and look at who the real Jesus is and live accordingly. Uh, as we keep reading here in Matthew 21 and verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the pole and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now the phrase Hosanna is derived from the Hebrew phrases uh, uh, Yasha, meaning save or deliver, and Na, which is a begging or praying for something to happen now. So it's essentially, save us now, please avenge us, deliver us, free us now. It started off as a Hebrew phrase that was a plea of desperation. Um, but then actually the, the, the Jewish people had, had, um, had it become something that became uh, a celebratory in the acknowledgement of God's ability to save. Um, the, the first time it's used in the Bible is in Exodus 2, where, where some goons are harassing the daughters of a Midianite priest and uh, Moses steps in to rescue them. Uh, the next time we see the word used is God using that same Moses to rescue his people by taking them out of Egyptian captivity. Sin is harassing us. And we, are, we were enslaved by our inability to rid ourselves of the darkness. And our souls cried out to Jesus, save me, please, now. And through the power and transformation of repentance, and our contact with the healing blood of Jesus in the waters of baptism, we are now delivered. We are now saved. We are now freed. Hosanna then becomes the appropriate posture 
for every single one of us, no matter how good we may have it, no matter what comforts we are blessed with, no matter the extent of our challenges, no matter the content of the culture or the culture of the content around us, Hosanna, save me, please, is the attitude of the heart that understands how desperately we need Jesus no matter what is going on in our lives. Whether in a current plea or a celebratory reminder, save us is how we should stand. Now, what does that mean exactly? Because it sounds good on a Sunday. It sounds great on a Sunday. You know, Jesus saving us actually starts with us surrendering our attempts to save ourselves. That means we have to welcome him into a space of authority in our lives, and rather than rely on our, our own wisdom or our own upbringing or what feels right at the time, we surrender the driver's seat to God's will, and we essentially take this, this uh, what would Jesus do idea, which I think sometimes has some plot holes. I think it's, well, what would Jesus tell you to do, Stephen? Like, like, what would Jesus uh, uh, demand in this situation? And that's how we surrender ourselves to God, and he saves us through that. But now, for a second, let's try and um, feel what it might have sounded like as Jesus walked in. You're going to see a word on the, on the projector here. When, when, when you see it, just say it loud, okay? Okay, next one. Great, next one. All right, keep it going. Okay, keep it going. All right, next one. What happened? That was quick. No, Jesus heard this Hosanna on Sunday. He clears the temple on Monday. He teaches parables on Tuesday. The Last Supper happens on Thursday. The betrayal and the betrayal and arrest happens on Thursday as well. And then the crowd is screaming, crucify him on Friday. Just like that. It was all this praise us, save us, deliver us, free us, crucify him. Just like that. I'm sure Jesus hears Hosanna on Sunday a lot. I'm sure that Sunday is a day where Hosanna is very loud. And it happens everywhere. And then what? You see, see how quick we can turn our Hosanna to the king, to hostility towards the king, just like that. Listen, it's, 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 not, it's not in here. My assumption is that the people that were cheering this followed him into Jerusalem, watched the trial, had the opportunity to say, actually, he's innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. We're the one that's wrong. And then the, the high priests say, do you want... Barabbas sent back to you, or Jesus. And they say, kill Jesus and let his blood be on us and our children. What happened to Hosanna? That was on Sunday. And now a couple of days later, violent hostility towards the one that saves. You know, we dropped off um, our, the, the gym that we go to as a child care. And, uh, and we, we dropped the kids off on, on Wednesday morning so Hannah and I could, could work out. And I got a call, maybe like five minutes in, saying, hey, um, Layla scratched her nose. We're going to put a, a wipe on it and, um, and you know, just want to let you know. It's like, okay. She, she scratched her own nose? Like she scratched herself? Well, not really. Okay, so what, what exactly happened? And... Uh, to, to Hannah's credit, Hannah was very calm, very, very put together. Enough that I was like, you know what? They said they're going to they're, they're clear it up, no problem. Sure. Then I go to pick her up, and she's still bleeding. Like, okay, that's interesting. That's, you know. And then, you know, Lucas, my little narcotics officer, um, said, Dad, a kid bit Layla on the nose. Twice. I was living a life of Hosanna on Sunday. I was very convinced that I need to, to, I need to surrender my thoughts and my, and my feelings and my attitude to God's will. I was at the marriage retreat on Sunday. I was loving life. 
I got to experience, like this, 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 this is a little slice of heaven that I'm willingly giving, like I love this. And then someone bit my kid's nose and she's bleeding and then you guys were dishonest about it? Hannah, very calm, very put together. I was not as calm. Um, I was, I, I, gotta be, I gotta be honest, I was, in, I was like, I was seeing red. I was very, very angry. Um, now, it's, I saw the kid, it's a little kid. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna do any, like it's, it's a child. <laughs> But I would like to speak to the parents, please. And the gym, very wisely, did not make that information available to me. Uh, I was so, so angry. There was not a lot of, of the peace that transcends all understanding in my heart in that situation. I was living Hosanna. Up until something happened that pushed me to the point where I had to decide, am I going to let my anger win here, or am I going to let God still drive? I think what that did for me, in, I mean, it just, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't, like, make that so I can make this point here in this lesson. But I think I have to be very humble, because I can point at the crowd, like, how could you guys do that? Like, how, how could you live with Jesus? How could you see the miracles? How could you walk with him? How could, you, how could you let this man feed you and heal your illness and then say, crucify him? How could, how could you be that daft? How could, you, how could you miss what's right there in your face? And then I look at my week. I look at the times that, that, I, that I have I've been up here preaching on a Sunday and then lost my temper with my kids in, in, as I'm picking them up right afterwards. I, I, I look at the times I'm, I, I talk about how much I love my wife and my family, and then I lose my patience with Hannah, like in the car on the way home. I have to be very, very careful, very careful, that I don't point at other people's sin as somehow I am immune to the same traps, the same shortcomings, as everyone else. Imagine the love that it required from Jesus to hear them saying Hosanna on Sunday. Like that kind of changes it a little bit. It goes from this like, ah, thanks guys, to knowing this is the same people. These are the same ones that are going to have so much hate in their heart come Wednesday that they're going to say they would rather have me killed. That love is not a license to be unrighteous, but it should compel us to carry our Sunday Hosanna throughout the rest of the week. It should change how we view everything, but we have to be humble. We have to remember his love to do that as well. You know, the eclipse came and went. Uh, Levi ended up being just as excited as his brother after we explained how the glasses work. He was protected and prepared so the sun was something that he could participate in and enjoy. A lot of people looked directly into the sun last week with no eye protection. You know, Google actually put out a chart to show the increase of searches that happened when people Googled, hey, my eyes hurt from looking at the sun. They showed the chart. It went from no one saying that to Tuesday, Everybody, apparently, had a lot of questions about, hey, wh why can't I see properly? Because a lot of people did not follow the simple instruction of do not look at the sun without the proper protection. I pray that no one in this room had to Google that same question because we were told all week, do not look at the sun. And so many people did. Now, Jesus is coming back. He is. We don't know when. We do know why. But when he does, those prepared and protected will be able to participate in the glory that follows him. 
if you are not ready, there will be no time for Google searches of what do I need to do? I missed it. There's no time for that. Now, that should have an air of warning attached, but I think it's more encouraging if you understand who Jesus is and if you understand what's been made available to you right now. If you understand that repentance is accessible today, right now, it's not a fear warning, it's an excitement. Of if I can, Are you saying that all I have to do is commit my life to Jesus and put away what doesn't work about the world and put on what does work about surrender to God's will? And then I get to experience the return of the sun in a way that doesn't damage me? That sounds like a good thing to do. It sounds like the better option of the two. If you understand who the sun is, if you understand who Jesus is, it makes total sense to do that now. My prayer is that all of us grow in our understanding, that we grow in our preparation, and we grow in our love for Jesus as we wait for him to come and permanently eclipse all of the pain and the suffering and the evil of this world and bring us into the radiant light beside him in heaven. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, for uh, helping us this morning. I really appreciate just a reminder that uh, Jesus is not who we want him to be. He is who we need him to be, but he's not who we want, who we want him to be or who we prefer him to be. He is, he is Jesus, and we need to get to know him, right? And we need to make sure that when we worship him, when we put the scriptures into practice, we're really keeping in mind who he is. So really appreciate uh, Stephen. Thank you for helping us this morning. If we can thank him one more time, church. And if you get a chance, and if you didn't get a chance, if you want to go back and listen to his message, just a reminder that it is available. It'll be available on our YouTube page, and this week it'll be available on our church website as well. Let me take you through a few prayer requests and announcements this morning. Please take note of these and share them uh, with uh, those who may not be here today. Uh, pray uh, for our brothers and sisters who are going through different uh, challenges. Let's continue to pray for Empado and Margaret's family as they uh, mourn the passing of her mom. Uh, let's also pray for Miss Charlene, uh, specifically her son Greg, who's dealing with health issues. Let's also pray for our sister Zesty and her family. Zesty's father passed away in Haiti uh, last week. Uh, obviously, you know we can come pray for the situation that's going on in Haiti. Uh, pray for peace, pray for guidance, pray for, for healing as well for Zesty's family. Uh, and let's also add to our prayer uh, list Gina Coates uh, and her family. Her sister Sarah passed away. Uh, so let's continue to pray for them uh, and uh, keep them in prayer. And if you get a chance to reach out and, you know, just offer yourself to listen, even if you don't know what to say. Sometimes that helps a lot. Uh, let's look ahead at our schedule for midweek services uh, this week. We'll be all together on Zoom at 7 p.m., uh, and then the week of the 24th, we'll meet with our Bible Talks, uh, either in person or in Zoom. Please speak to your Bible Talk leaders for times and locations. Uh, next Sunday and all Sundays in April, we'll be here for service at 10 a.m. at PS 180. So we'll see you here and also on, online if you're uh, joining us remote. And then today, if you happen to be hungry after service and you want to also, or you just want to support the team ministry, uh, the team ministry is having their Soul Food Sunday. That's today in the cafeteria. Please help support the team ministry's fundraising efforts for their youth and family camps that are coming up later this summer. All proceeds will go towards sending our teens and preteens to camp. Uh, lunch plates are $10, desserts are $2, and drinks are $1. So make your way to the cafeteria and uh, get some good and also do some good by supporting the teen ministry. Um, and I mentioned the camps that are coming up. Camp registration is open and live for the 2024 teen camp titled Chat G-O-D. You see what we did there? You see what we did there? Chat GPT, Chat G-O-D. It's happening August 11th. Well, I said we did. I didn't do that. I'm just reading it. But that's what was done, right? So August 11th through the 17th at Camp Tawanda, the cost is $550 per, per camper. 
The theme is inspired by ChatGPT and artificial intelligence system reshaping the digital landscape, and we hope to bridge the gap between faith and technology. In a world with endless data, many youths find themselves lost in the noise of online platforms and search engines, but amidst the chaos, there is a beacon of hope, God's unwavering presence and unlimited wisdom. Isaiah 55 verse 9 reads, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And our goal is to empower our teens to seek God's wisdom in a world flooded with information. Uh, so this is a, every year, amazing things happen. This is a great way to support our team ministry by paying, you know, by paying a visit to the cafeteria and also by registering, right? So if you're able, if you're ready to register your camper, you can go to our church website, nyccoc.net, click on the events tab, and there you'll find the link to register. And maybe you're not ready, but go ahead and check out that link just to make sure you know what you need to do to get ready for that. Now, our singles ministry here in Harlem are having a game night for family fun on Saturday, April 20th. That's this Saturday at 5 p.m. We're going to join singles from the Bronx, Westchester, and Harlem right here at PS 180. Uh, we'll have board games, card games, and light snacks. Please bring your friends, bring, bring your coworkers, bring your family. And that's this Saturday at 5 p.m. Uh, next Sunday, we have our Hope in Harlem Blood Drive, the third annual Blood Drive. Um, and that's happening next Sunday right here at PS 180. It starts at 11 a.m. during our service and will continue until 4 p.m. If you would like to find out more information or you would like to sign up, please text Gunther Stroman at 646-234-9913. Uh, so let me tell you about a couple of things to save the date, to look ahead. Uh, the teen ministry is having their spring semi-formal dance and senior honoring on Saturday, May 18th at 7 p.m. at Lehman College, 250 Bedford Park Boulevard West in the Bronx. That's one. And then two, for the men here in Harlem, we're going to have a men's Sunday service entitled Men Who Dream, empowering godly leadership for communities and families. And that's Sunday, May 19th at 10 a.m. right here at PS 180. So brothers, look forward to that. Sisters, you know men, you know men right? So you can look forward to that, too, and you can invite them and let them know so they can come out and hang out, hang out with the brothers, all right? So you can stay connected. You can find out more details about these events and others on our church website at nyccoc.net slash Harlem. Please go there. I got one more important, really great announcement happening today at 3 p.m., Lakeisha's baptism. Lakeisha's getting baptized. Is Lakeisha here? Is she here, Lakeisha? No? Oh, it's... It's next Sunday. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a, this was practice for next Sunday. That's what I, so next Sunday, the, I'm going to say that. But let me tell you that it's happening not today. It's happening next Sunday. Thank you, Chris. Uh, at 429 West 154th Street, number one. So you got the information there on the screen. You also have it on our church website. Let's stand together and sing one more song. Test. Test, test, test. Wow. Testing. Y'all ready to view that holy city? All right. Sing along. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna view that holy city one of these days. You know that I'm, I'm gonna view that holy city one of these days. Hallelujah! I'm gonna view that holy city. View that holy city. View that holy city one of these days. One, one of these days. days. I'm gonna view that holy city one of these days. You know that I'm, I'm gonna view that holy city one of these days. Hallelujah! I'm gonna view that holy city, view that holy city one of these days, one of these days. I'm gonna sing and never get tired one of these days. You know that I'm, I'm gonna sing and never get tired one of these days. Hallelujah! I'm gonna sing and never get tired one of these days. Hallelujah! I'm gonna sing and never get tired one of these days. One of these days. One of these days. One of these days. 